thought about it. But now that we're mm -hmm. here together, Brett, <clears throat> you know, I have the feeling that when, when you talk, especially when you talk from a, a, a bully pulpit, you know, a high place, um, you, you can give overtones and undertones of what you say. And it's, it's not, not by accident. It's, it's intentional uh, that you can communicate at another level entirely. For example, we have had violence. We have anti-Semitic act, actions all over the country now at an mm -hmm. unprecedented rate. Mm -hmm. Only in the last few weeks of his term. Um, why are these people being activated? How are they being activated? Somehow, a message is being sent. And it's not, it's not with the words themselves. It's with the overtones or undertones of the words. Perhaps it's what you don't say that sends the message. Do you agree? I mean, when you make a speech from a high bully pulpit, you are talking at many levels. It's like an orchestra. It's not just one tone. It's not the leading you know, melody of the song. It's all kinds of other communications, no? Yeah, I would argue it's mostly subtext. All, the, all those uh, presidential, presidential speeches, any kind of major policy speech, it's entirely subtext. And the literal, this is one of the tricks that we, I've noticed uh, being played lately is they'll go back to the transcript and literally it says something that seems palatable, but when you look carefully at what that really means, it means something completely different than what's being said. Good, a great example is uh, in the uh, Holocaust uh, uh, mor memorial where the, the Jews are mentioned as kind of secondary or tertiary type victims of this. When, uh, y y you know, they're not even mentioned in the press release. So this is, this is the kind of thing where you could say, well, yeah, lots of people died in the Holocaust, but who was the main group? What was the main group? And if you leave that out, you're sending a message. You're sending a message, right. Sending it's a message. Not only what you say, but what you don't say. What you don't say. And, and then how long it takes you to say it. Yes. That came up several times, like with the uh, murder of the, the Indian uh, uh, Kansas City. folks. Yeah, in yeah. Kansas. Yeah. I, I find it extraordinary, and it's, it's not what I've concluded personally. It's not a, a mistake. It's not an accident. Yeah. Somebody's writing this stuff up. And he's, you know, I noticed last night when he was, um, you know, doing his, was it last night? Doing his, um, uh, you know, State of the Union, if you will, he was reading it from a prompter. Uh -huh. Before, during the campaign, he was just going off the cuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> was he ever <laughs> going off the cuff? Yeah. But now it's from the prompter, which means, which tells you that somebody's writing it up. And this exact uh -huh. subtext problem is coming up because the guy who's writing it up is writing the subtext. Yeah, writing uh, the, the messages that are going to be interpreted by the different interest groups. And also, I think it's dangerous to um, view a person's scripted speech from a teleprompter as something uh, other than what it is. It's a person, any person could stand up in front of a group and read off a teleprompter <coughs> and sound reasonable and rational. What you really want to look at is uh, when you're not doing that and what do you say. And that's the true uh, nature of the character. Yeah. And this all, go, this all points to the fact that in a free society, which, you know, can always be at risk, um, I'm always reminded of Ben Franklin coming out of Liberty Hall in, was it, 1789, and a woman who was waiting outside for the revelation of the big secret they were discussing in there. She said, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government will we have? And his answer was, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. It's fragile. Yeah, democracy. Like, people uh, misunderstand democracy as something that's supposed to be efficient and clean, and it's actually the opposite. Like the more contention, the more uh, voices in the room, the better democracy is. And it's slower, but uh, you get a better end, end product. Yeah. And that was the vision of the Founding Fathers, I think. Yeah, and they were so right about that, mm -hmm. but the fragility sometimes is greater, or seems to be greater than other times. <clears throat> so people get frustrated about the speed, too. You know, the, yeah, how sure. fast things happen. Like, oh, do we really have to take this to both chambers of Congress? Do we really? <laughs> let's just write an executive order. Wouldn't yeah, that be so much easier? Yeah. And that's not, uh, that's not what we're in this country for. No. And, and you can write an executive order that happens to be brilliant, but mm -hmm. humanity is frail. May, may I say uh, imperfectible? 
Um, and so if you give somebody a lot of power uh, to write fiat executive orders, next thing you know, we've seen so many examples over the centuries, next thing you know, he takes the power and he takes more power. Mm -hmm. It corrupts him mm -hmm. and it makes him, you know, infatuated with his own power. And then, th then, you, then you know that the founding fathers were right for reasons you didn't fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> True, and you also have to understand that even no matter how powerful a person is, they need other people to carry out these orders. And I think you saw with the immigration executive order how uh, fraught that was for misinterpretation or overzealous interpretation or uh, confusion or whatever it was. There were all sorts of problems because uh, it was just basically dropped on people and uh, everybody had to just make it up as they went. And that's, that's not a good way to run government either. But there was again a subtext in all of that. The subtext is not only in the State of the Union type speech, it's in an executive order that's vague. Mm -hmm. And uh, my take on the subtext is that uh, you immigration guys, you know, you've been frustrated a long time. Um, you haven't been able to do what you really wanted to do, to, to do your mission in the way that you would like to do it. And I'm unleashing you. And that term, I've seen that term used. They feel unleashed now. They go out, they're told, now you can make arrests. And they make hundreds of arrests of unlawful aliens, uh, un undocumented aliens. Um, and all of a sudden, the immigration service is a different animal, and those guys are unleashed. That's what's happening, I think. And what troubles me about that is that that's one law enforcement agency. There are others, too, and there is the entire military, too, which is supposed to get $54 billion extra dollars <laughs> in the budget this year. So, <clears throat> yeah, Weren't you know. sitting around saying the military is underfunded in the United States? We really need a lot more money for our military? <laughs> Wasn't that like on the top of your mind all the time, <laughs> every morning when you wake up? No. <laughs> no. I mean, I, frankly, I think that uh, Trump is, is, is pandering to the military. He wants them to be his friend. And I am reminded of Seven Days in May, the, uh, the Burt Lancaster, uh, Kirk Douglas movie about a coup that took place in the, uh, uh, fictionally uh, in, the, uh, in the White House um, in the early 60s. And uh, what you need to do a coup is the military. And right. uh, if you want to resist, for example, an impeachment process, the military can help you save your office, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How else would we, would we have the power to do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So going on to the whole question of how well the press is doing in these difficult times. Hmm. Uh, so they're being charged with the enemy of the people, they're charged with fake news. Nothing, you know, like the term fake news to confuse everybody about what's true or not. Um, claiming, for example, the New York Times and uh, what, even uh, CNN, hmm. the BBC, the BBC is against him. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> would you ever have believed anybody would ever say such a thing? Completely unprecedented and unjustified in our time. Um, how does the press react to this? They must be really unhappy to be criticized that way. Uh, well, a couple of the uh, big newspapers have turned it into marketing slogans. Uh, Washington Post says <laughs> something about darkness. I, it's slipping my mind. Like in, 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 you know what I'm talking about? The in darkness, we something or other. And then the New York Times made their uh, new marketing pitch about truth and how truth is uncomfortable and truth is difficult and truth is in the New York Times. So they've uh, they're actually doing quite well in this. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's their intention. I don't think their intention is to make more money, but I think they're responding pretty well, especially the Washington Post. I've been really impressed with what they've done. It's a time for courage. Time for courage. Time for courage. And uh, it's, a, it's a time for putting things into the light, not for secrecy and operating in the darkness. And I think that's the Washington Post uh, motto's essence is, Let's do all this in uh, full view of the public, not behind closed doors. And I think they have, uh, they have really responded pretty well. Uh, the regional papers, the smaller papers, they're getting crushed by all this. And how, how, how are they getting crushed? Uh, because they, are, don't, they aren't really players in it, you know, like they're not players in the Trump circus but they're the targets because they're in the rural communities, they're in the um, smaller towns, they're in the places where uh, people will attack them for fake news or ah, stop buying so advertisements. they can't attack Trump that way. They're, they're limited. Yeah, I mean, the New York Times and Washington Post have a lot of resources. They can withstand this kind of pressure. Yeah. Uh, the family-owned newspaper in Duluth or something, they're, they're, they're going to have a harder time. 
Yeah, and when and everybody in town is mad at them, it's not a good thing for them. Yeah, and it's not it's not their issue. Yeah, their right. issue is covering their town. Right. And when the um, president of the United States calls the media enemy of the people, and you have a bunch of like a mob like atmosphere about that, and that can really hurt a lot of people, and it really hurts the the uh, the ground floor of journalism. And in do in so doing, it hurts. It, all, all it hurts it all whole, because the, the New York Times uh, reporters come from somewhere. They don't start at the New York Times. Yeah. They start in Hoboken or something, and yeah. then they work their way up. And if there's no, there's no minor leagues, uh, then the major leagues aren't going to be any good. Yeah. You know, I, I took a look at the stock price for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very interesting examination. And uh, over the past few months, uh, since they've been having this war with Trump, or Trump has been having this war with them. I don't think, you know, <laughs> you could say it's mutual, but I think he's the one, he's the protagonist in all of this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> their stock price has gone down. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I'm sure the circulation has gone up. And so there's, you know, the question in my mind is the stock price down, the circulation is up, and they got all kinds of you know, uh, what do you call it, um, they're, they're, they're trying to market themselves now. Mm -hmm. They're coming up with deals and they're reaching mm -hmm. out and mm -hmm. uh, they want to they get more people to subscribe. Yeah. Oh, they're getting a lot more people. And they should. They still haven't turned it into money. They're, I mean, they're an island in the storm. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is, why is this stock price going down? And I got a theory, I want to throw my theory at you. My theory is that advertisers are a large part of profitability. Mm -hmm. And if the advertisers are backing away from you because they are so ha somehow intimidated, then, you know, you don't have as much advertising and then your stock price goes down because you can't make the same profit without your big advertisers. You think this could be happening? Uh, I don't know, but uh, my speculation would be it's when you uh, go to a partisan type atmosphere as opposed to a um, centralized type media source that uh, uh, appeals to both sides you're going to lose audience and revenue. Uh, and I suspect that's what's happening. Like the New York Times was not being targeted as this liberal outpost and, uh, you know, off the charts to the left or something. You probably would have more of an audience um, stability on the, on the right side with conservative readers and mm -hmm. conservative advertisers and, and uh, people who support that mindset. But... It's really, it, uh, the president has really set up this us versus them mantra and if The opposing people, party, he calls if, them. If people are advertising in the New York Times and their primary customers are Trump supporters, that could lead them into, you know, financial trouble. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't have any idea if that's happening, but that's, that would be my speculation. Yeah. If you think about the penny press and how, uh, you know, the money really came into journalism through this centrist viewpoint of, you know, sell newspapers to the left, to the right, everybody in between. We don't just have one side in our paper. And uh, that, that makes a bigger audience. And, yeah. and that's, I think, getting fractured right yeah. now. And that's, that's what happens when you have a polarized society, as we do. Mm -hmm. um, w right after this break, Brad, I want to come back and talk about the, the compromise that's happening. Uh, you know, it seems to me, as we talked about it before the show began, uh, that a lot of people seem to be willing to give him a chance now because he was making certain rational sounds and therefore, um, you know, they don't take the same positions on him anymore. They're not as quick to criticize him. They're going along with the program. They're compromising the principles that they spoke of a few weeks ago. Um, I see that in my, in my little world. Um, and maybe that's happening on a larger scale. But wh if that is happening, if it is happening, how will that affect journalists? How will it affect this whole battle between the, you know, these newspapers who have been standing up? Will it affect their willingness to stand up? Let's take the short break, come back, and see what you think about that. Okay. <laughs> hey, has your signal just been taken over, or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha. I'm Reg Baker, the host of Business in Hawaii that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Today we were very fortunate enough to have a Dr. Miller and her service dog, Muffin. 
Uh, we talked yeah. about the ADA, and we covered some of the different do's and don'ts of having service dogs in your establishment uh, and how to sniff out the fakes. Please uh, tune in for Business in Hawaii on Thursday to find out all about service dogs. Aloha. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we can't get a handle on exactly what's going on. We don't know where we are in the tipping point here and where the tipping point is tipping. But uh, one thing I want to mention is the dead cat. The dead cat scenario is when you have a business meeting, and this is all driven out of a sort of business mentality. When you have a business meeting, you make an outrageous position, okay, that just shakes everybody up at the table, and they're just reeling. And then, you know, you throw a dead cat on the table. And everybody forgets how outrageous your position was because throwing the dead cat on the table is much more outrageous. It's, the, it's moving the news cycle ahead so you forget what happened just a minute ago. And I think that's part of what's going on. We're all off balance here because the news cycle is moving so quickly. And so, so many surprises and outrages, if you will, uh, are happening that we forget what happened. And if you forget, then you are doomed to repeat it, aren't, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, well, I think maybe uh, another way to look at it is that he's pushing the expectations so far afield that when he comes back to some just wacky position, we're like, oh, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> that's <laughs> and it. And we tolerate it. That's you it. Know, oh, we're going to build uh, the Great Wall of China on the Mexico border? Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, no. Now we're just going to build a fence. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a business negotiation trick is uh, what it is. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it really it, 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 it resonates for me. So going back to the question, the, the cliffhanger, if you will, yes, be, before our uh, break, um, you know, if, so are we having compromise now? Why are we having, why are people who are so strong, it's marginal, it's not everybody, but why are people who are so strong in their position, their criticism of Trump only a few weeks ago now softening and saying, well, you know, maybe he is rational, maybe he can come out of this and be a civilized human being, maybe he can be a good president even, maybe he can be a good leader even. Um, I, I, I don't believe that. Um, most people I know don't believe that. But there are people who now are entertaining that thought. And is, you, do you think that's playing around the country? Do you think it's playing with the press? Uh, I, I, I hate to be a cynic, but I think that this is part of the changing narrative in media to keep people interested in the story. If, uh, if, if the president keeps uh, doing the same thing over and over, people will get bored of it. But um, we, have this, we have these kind of meta-narratives in our society that we like to always go back to. We have the Horatio Alger, pull up your bootstraps one, and then we also have the redemption, like the prodigal son, where <laughs> you know, somebody messes up, messes up, messes up, oh, but they learn their lesson, and they come back, and now they're good again. <laughs> and I think that was the storyline last night, was, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll forgive him now. Yeah, maybe he's okay. 21 standing ovations he got. Mostly from Republicans, yeah, but was, <laughs> nevertheless. Mostly from one side if you saw the, the white angle. On the that. other guys were <laughs> sitting down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, don't, I think uh, part of it is this, this changing narrative that keeps the people interested. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily something that the media uh, organizations sit around and plot, like, oh, let's change our narrative today. But they probably think, what's the most interesting part of this speech? Oh, this is different than what we had yesterday, so let's play that story. And that's how it shifts. The other, I think the other uh, big part there is that people want the country to do well, so you have this inherent desire to not hate your president. <laughs> you don't want the country to go into, you know, apocalyptic chaos. You want uh, things to work out, and every little kernel you get, you kind of hold on to. So wishful thinking is what Wishful it thinking, yeah. but it's very dangerous thinking because, um, as history has proven many, many times, that uh, these, these folks in power aren't, no, aren't going to suddenly have some epiphany and change. They're going to continue doing what, they're, what they've done to get to that power position. And they might do small things that you like, like the, the Germans could make the trains run on time, but it was not something that uh, equates to some of the horrible things they did on the other end. Yeah. I think we always have to remember this is the Trump show. It's just like The Apprentice. It's trying to keep the audience uh, ratings high, trying to keep people interested, 
trying to develop a persona that surprises you, if not delights you, and every day you want the public to follow you. And he's been mm -hmm. doing that. I mean, it's what, I, it's what I just described is exactly what he's been doing. And the press has been following it. Some people say the press are gullible because they follow it and, you know, they, they bite on his bait all the time. Uh, even the New York Times, the first 20 articles in every single edition, they're all about him. Mm -hmm. After a while, people, you know, become mainliners. Mm -hmm. on what, what, what about Trump? What did he do today? Yeah. What did he do today? Yeah. And, and he's got to do something different. Uh, organizations have, have bought into that, too. Yeah. If, uh, if uh, the president had the same sane, rational type of tone tomorrow and the next day and the next day, people will get bored. So I'm predicting here on video that this is going to change <laughs> within the next few days. Uh, I don't see this as like a permanent change. True, true. Yeah. There'd be something else to surprise and either delight or make us out outraged <laughs> again. But let me go to the, the principal question we're here for. You know, <clears throat> So we have now, I was just astounded. I mean, if there's a stronger word, I'd use it. <laughs> astounded with the fact that he excluded known, you know, first-line media from a White House press conference. That is outrageous. I mean, I've never in the history of this country or anywhere, except maybe out of Nazi Germany, would you exclude known media, who, you know, who are read by millions of people from a White House press conference and systematically exclude the guys who weren't, you know, giving him kudos. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys who were criticizing him, they're the ones who got excluded. That is such a perversion of journalism and the truth and democracy in general, and yet he got away with it. Nobody sued him. Could have. I, I think could have. Mm -hmm. um, no, the outrage was not nearly as palpable as I thought it would be. What happened there? Well, to begin with, they, they did it in a uh, kind of pilot way. It was a gaggle situation, not an official press conference. It was kind of like a side uh, deal. They had a pool reporter in there. So their rhetorical uh, play on this was, this was a pool event, and we weren't excluding uh, these groups. We were just offering a pool, uh, which means that one reporter sits in for the others. And this happens quite often. Uh, unfortunately, where um, there's just not enough room to accommodate all the media that wants to be in the in the place, and mm -hmm. uh, one group, will, one one organization, or a couple of organizations will get chosen from the from the masses, and and will represent everybody. And then the agreement in that is that you give your all your raw media to the to the group, and everybody can use it as if it's theirs. Now, in this case, uh, I think they were trying to see what they could get away with. It did cause a big uproar, and I think if it would have continued, there would have been lawsuits and, and much more problems. But mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was outrageous. Now, the question, th I think the, uh, interest, like the interesting dichotomy here is uh, the president gave a very long press conference a, f a, a few days, weeks ago, where he answered questions for, for you know, over an hour. And he answered them from all sorts of people. So that is actually a, sort of an unusual behavior in terms of, you know, like if you look to George W. Bush or something, he would call on the most softball reporters in the room and answer three or four questions and then skedaddle out of there, right? So this, um, this approach was, uh, I don't know if he was daring people to ask him questions or what the situation was. He but thought was, he could handle it. Thought he could handle he it. Didn't handle it very well. Handled it very poorly. And I haven't seen him do it again. We'll see if he tries it again. But um, I, I don't think it's that unusual for presidents to try to call on folks that will be sympathetic to them. My, my concern about what happened with this exclusion is that, A, the public in general doesn't realize what, what happened and, and what that means. B, um, I, I think, as you said, it's a pilot, and when, it, when he wants to do it again, he will do it again, and so we probably have a long-term track, a trajectory on this, and I worry that the press will be intimidated, that it will affect their reporting, mm -hmm. uh, just as a practical matter, as reality. Oh, I, I think that if you saw the fawning last night, I, I think you would you would uh, have evidence for that. This was uh, a president who met with the TV reporters, tried to smooth this out, gave this somewhat rational uh, State of the Union address, 
and then the TV, uh, particularly the TV cable news uh, type folks, were fawning over uh, the speech like it was, you know, the Gettysburg Address or something. He's playing them. Yeah, it He's was a really. Uh, it was. Uh, here, talk about astounded or astonished or shocked to see the fawning so quickly turn. Uh, that's what disturbed me. It's a practical thing. It's a business thing. It's a money thing. Is protecting their organization from economic uh, being economically undermined. Um, and I wonder, you know, going forward, if this kind of thing happens where they get played and he plays his good cop, bad cop thing, you know, and tries to manipulate them sort of sadomasochistically into being intimidated and you know, winning by intimidation as his style, what happens to our democracy? You have one minute. Well, I mean, the, the troubling uh, part of this is all the behind the scenes um, maneuvering where the press secretary will say, oh, you don't, you don't want to do this story, well, I'm going to pitch this over to so-and-so, your com competitor, and give them a scoop that you can't have. And there's all sorts of that stuff going on, including a planted story recently to disparage a, a reporter. Um, I'm, I'm uh, forgetting his name, but basically the, the idea was there was a conference call, there was some kind of question asked, the reporter uh, laughed at Sean Spicer's response, and the um, press secretary turned it into laughing at the, the, uh, the issue, which was about a, a fallen soldier, and tried to plant the story that the reporter's laughing at the death of the soldier. Oh. And uh, that oh. actually got published. And so these kinds of, talk about intimidation. I mean, you think the White House is going to plant stories about you uh, laughing at the death of a soldier? You can only imagine the trolls that came after that reporter. <laughs> uh, I think it's a really serious threat to democracy. And um, we, we have to, I mean, it's easy for us, you and I, to sit and say we've got to support journalism, but it's really going to come down to the bigger audience. You know, are, are you going to support your newspaper, are you going to support your websites you visit to, or are you going to um, uh, rally for journalists and media coverage, or are you going to let them just take the beating and, and uh, you suffer the consequences as well? I'm with you, Brett. I remember uh, my own experience, um, oh, during one of those Gulf Wars, uh, driving into Kaneohe Base, and I would say, with lots of passion in my heart, I would say to the sentry there, thank you, yeah. every time. Yeah, thank you. And I think we should say thank you to the press when they are courageous, and we should encourage them to be courageous, every bloody one. Because yeah, they're human beings, and they're getting up, and they have families, they have you know, issues outside of work. They're taking this punishment, and the reward is very small. So um, uh, gratitude's a start, and also advocacy for journalists and yeah. the First Amendment. Yeah. When something like this happens, you know, uh, call your senators and say, you know, you don't accept it. Yeah. And that goes for, you know, we should love the press. We should support the press. We should be more act active, you know, in, in supporting them and um, giving them courage. And the same thing with, with those guys who teach journalism at UH, Manila. <laughs> and All that right. means you, Brett, Brett Opergaard, our regular contributor on such things. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you.